I'm uh, Roach and Sankar uh, from Infabrica. I'm really excited to be here. Um, our first tech field day for Infabrica. I'm uh, stoked to actually present to you all the Accelerated Compute Fabric. You probably looked at the title and was wondering what is ACFS. It stands for Accelerated Compute Fabric SuperNIC. And we'll talk about what Infabrica has been up to for the last uh, uh, three and a half years, building what is basically a new category of networking silicon to enable systems for accelerated computing and AI at unprecedented scale. So I'll start with a brief intro on the company and uh, the problem that we're going after. Um, our mission overall at Infabrica is very simple. We saw a few years back that the model of compute was changing in the data center. Um, a few years back, we saw the first kind of foray of accelerators such as GPUs and TPUs really changing the, the population of, of processing and, uh, and changing the, the surface of compute and the nature of that compute within the data center. Um, interesting story, when we first started validating this back in 2020, 2021, um, to pretty big luminaries of, of pretty large clouds, hyperscale clouds that we spoke to actually said, uh, uh, you know, like the GPU portion of the fleet is so small, it doesn't really demand its own like different networking solution. Um, so how times have changed. Our mission has now been kind of taken forward by a team that is now uh, north of 120 engineers. We've all built previous infrastructure products. My background, I've been a chip guy for uh, more than 25 years, um, mostly for big chips for infrastructure. Um, along with all of the all of my colleagues at uh, Infabrica, we built NICs, switches, high performance accelerators, um, TPUs, graphics, um, host networking stacks. And that mission that I talked about is actually an equal part software and hardware um, endeavor. So the product that we're talking about is called the Accelerated Compute Fabric Super NIC, or ACFS specifically designed for high performance distributed AI and GPU server networking. Our first chip, which um, we'll talk about more during the, the presentation, is codenamed Millennium. And it is uh, the first NIC to hit eight terabits per second of bandwidth in a single chip. Um, as a baseline, the NICs that populate you know, all of the high performance computing and AI clusters today are at 400 gigabits per second. So this is a, a different ball game that we're trying to create here. So what is the problem overall that we're trying to solve? And uh, this is not a very original slide. Uh, it's been shown in various different forms. But the, the basic point is that compute flops are actually scaling very fast and, and quite efficiently. We're able to pack both through architecture um, as well as Silicon design, just a lot more compute uh, in the surface area of a, of a server. And that's the uh, tope line that you're seeing going uh, at the top. And this is a log scale, by the way. So you can see how much over the last decade compute uh, intensity has really accelerated uh, across GPUs and accelerators. The bottom two lines represent data movement, both IO bandwidth and memory bandwidth. And so one line has different memory technologies, the other one has interconnect technologies attached to the surface of one server chipset or chip. And you can see that you know, these, these curves are, are diverging significantly. And if you know your Amdahl's law, what it means is that any kind of balanced compute system needs to balance between memory, compute, and I.O. And what we're seeing is effectively a, a significant departure on the scaling of I.O and memory bandwidth compared to the amount of compute intensity. And that's a problem if you want to build distributed, resilient, scalable systems. You can try to build everything in one big chip to get rid of those bottlenecks, but that, as we know, is pretty impossible when models are already, already exceeding what can be housed in even eight or 64 GPUs. And the problem 
is both physical, but it's also about the architectures of system I.O. System I.O. architectures that are being used today for accelerated computing are basically the same ones that have been used for traditional compute. So we haven't really reinvented how I.O. and networking works in the context of AI. And why is that a now problem? Well, the now problem is not that we're trying to solve the problem of how to interconnect eight GPUs or 128 GPUs. The problem is plastered all over our news feeds from you know, the information and Reuters and, and uh, TechCrunch with companies building hundreds of thousands of GPU nodes or accelerator nodes and trying to do that with whatever data center real estate power um, cost budget that they can actually afford to, to put these in. And so the scaling has gone super linear in the last 12 to 18 months, looks to continue that way based on the fact that, and this is something that has been proven by some seminal papers, been published by Google, some of the folks at OpenAI, that compute intensity model uh, effectiveness or model performance can scale with compute intensity as defined by uh, flops, floating point operations per second. And so there are a couple of metrics for that. I'm going to talk about MFU and HFU. Model flops utilization or MFU is the ratio of observed performance or throughput in a forward or backward pass of the model. And this is for training in this particular case. And the ratio of that to the theoretical maximum that's possible in the GPU. It doesn't include any overheads for uh, memory access uh, or checkpointing. And it doesn't include any, any excess computing that's used for activation, normalization, checkpointing, and the like. Typical MFUs are around 30 to 50%. So that's pretty low if you look at it. Hardware flops utilization is the actual number of flops that are actually that are uh, used in the in the form of in the compute workloads. HFU tends to be about 15% higher than MFU, which means that there's 15% more, you know, computation that's being done on flops at that point. What's interesting is that we really haven't seen any data point that suggests that you can get more than 60% HFU out of out of a GPU. And why that's important is that if the 60% kind of ceiling is there, then the more and more recomputation, whether useful recomputation that you, that you can do, or the more and more that the network drives in terms of uh, stalls or failures that leads to more and more, quote unquote, wasted compute, actually drops that efficiency. So when we start scaling to like hundreds of thousands of GPU nodes, what do we think our MFU is going to be? It's already at 30 to 50 percent. This could actually be degrading faster than we think. So the network is one of the important factors that actually impacts MFU efficiency and the <laughs> overall amount of useful compute at scale. And this is a problem that we think from a networking point of view and from an I.O. point of view that we may but, but solve. Chan, uh, doesn't the I'm not sure. I guess with quantization, isn't that going to have a, uh, a chilling effect on some of the computational requirements in the future? In terms of taking it down? Yeah. Yeah, I think that's already happened with moving from bfloat 16 down to like 8 to FP4. I mean, that's already happening. That's what's actually increasing the compute intensity already. But even with those, you will continue to see MFU go up, but then drop down just because of scale. The amount of theoretical flops that you have in the system is higher. The efficiency of mapping them to each individual node and all of them working in concert is still at this kind of wall of 60%. And you think the cap of 30 or 50% is due to data transfer? No. That, that is the, na the natural observed amount relative to what the theoretical maximum of the GPU is. It's a combination of software, it's a combination of system, it's all those factors. But if when you scale, there's more and more loss of that efficiency, then that's just going to drop. That's the point. 
that we're trying to make. So I'm going to spend a few minutes talking about just the systems perspective of how we got to the current architectures, because I think it's important context. So many of you are familiar with the supercomputing model. This is like SGI and, and mainframes and back in the day, uh, CC NUMA, uh, cash coherent NUMA. How these systems were built, where there were many parallel workers, they had shared memory in some cases, but they sharded a big computational problem by splitting it up. Um, and the worker nodes synchronized with each other. And they did this at very low latency because the communication protocols for talking to each other was like very deeply ingrained in the actual architecture itself and in the in the software. Um, so it wasn't, it was really a closed system. You know, UPI is an example of that from the CPU world, but um, you can think of NVLink as basically being the same thing, a very uh, tightly coupled interconnect for scaling in, in this manner. But the biggest rate of scaling that we've observed in, in the compute industry was with hyperscale cloud. So we saw client server designs where everything was distributed, communication protocols became normalized, and how we distributed tasks was sharding individual tasklets to individual independent domains and then networking them together. And that networking had high aggregate throughput, but the demand on that throughput was not necessarily very high per individual node. The network had high tolerance, for, or the, the workload had a high toler higher tolerance for latency in terms of you know, microseconds, tens of microseconds to, to milliseconds. And these systems were very linearly scalable because they had no shared fate. Every domain was allowed, had its own operating system, was able to fail gracefully and independently, could be failed over to different VMs or different nodes. And it's important to note that the biggest TCO savings that we saw over the past 15 years was from this model, this model of scaling. Supercomputers didn't get all that cheaper in the time that it scaled the previous way. So now when you look at AI and machine learning systems and accelerated computing in, in general. Uh, I like to say um, super has met hyper because what these workloads demand is basically a marriage of those two. We can't do everything fully distributed. We can't do everything in a centralized uh, mainframe type of approach. So modern infrastructure requires both the tight performance of a supercomputer and the elastic scaling of threads and the resiliency that you get from, from cloud. And that model has started to be built with existing components. And we've heard of the term scale up and scale out. Scale up refers to you know, the, the, that supercomputing domain, the local uh, tightly coupled domain, and scale out refers to the larger distributed system radius. But what's important is that the programming models are actually different. The programming models for scale up is very low level, primitives, um, you know, like CUDA, defines things like a memory copy from one place to another. And scale out has, had, has leveraged very structured communication and computation kernels, like what we see in um, CCL libraries, uh, MPI libraries, and the like. So we have these two kind of this duality of communication and programming models that have to exist. But these programming models have been actually made very robust over decades. So we don't want to reinvent that. The current state of the art with respect to hyperscale AI, we can see that these domains, which we refer to in the scale up as Interprocess communication, or IPC, and the distributed domain, the remote procedure call, or RPC domains, they're both expanding. We're getting bigger NVLink or tightly coupled uh, domains, and we're also seeing tens of thousands of GPUs and accelerators scaling over the surface of uh, not just a single data center, but over multiple data centers. So we have a sizing problem. The communication radius is now just increased significantly in both directions. And 
As you see from the diagram on the right, they've actually been addressed by different communication networks. You see at the top, there's GPU fabric switches that are trying to address that scale up, and this whole mess of devices in the middle, including PCIe switching to get to high-performance NICs, to get to a multi-tiered class network of switches and routers to get to the other side of GPUs. That's the scale out or RPC direction. These fabrics actually scale disparately. They don't talk to each other today. So we built one network on the side and we built this network. And oh, by the way, there's a third network, the front end network that actually connects to the data center in order to actually access your data store for ingestion to the web, to users and the like. By having these two different fabrics scaling differently, there are different primitives. Um, there's also imbalanced burst bandwidth. If you have to communicate in one direction, you get one set of performance. If suddenly that model parallel operation has to go in the scale out direction, you get a different performance. The speeds and feeds aren't the same. Uh, the GPU fabrics, for example, in today's you know, highest performing standard baseline GPUs that are being deployed is nine times the bandwidth of what you get through PCIe to the NIC that's attached to it. That's just an artifact of just how the, the, the GPUs are designed. So we have imbalanced bandwidth to the, to the accelerators themselves. As I said, taking any one of them in either direction is infeasible. You can't scale coherency and IPC interprocess communication to infinite lengths. We've seen the cost model of supercomputers and the efficiency of supercomputers when you do that. And on the flip side, if you are doing very low latency, super high bandwidth, tensor parallel operations, doing them over a network hop is doing it all the time, necessarily, entirely over a network. Connection is inefficient, unnecessarily inefficient. So there is a network problem at the heart of this. And the thing that we have observed, we've heard from customers and are, are seeing right now is that scaling the fabrics is actually reducing further the compute utilization. And uh, a larger surface of GPU communication over collectives can lead to congestion, many GPUs hitting one through what we call in-cast. More tiers of networking lead to more potential congestion points, contention points, jitter, latency. And any kind of, and as you scale, the biggest thing that happens is failures, right? Failures occur and uh, they can strand or stall the compute. 